I'll say I'm really proud that we have our first international board member in Canada. And because of the technology, it's like he's right next door. <laughs> and Brian hails from the great white north. And um, yeah, maybe this bio is a little goofy. Brian recently retired from a 25 year career as a city planner in Toronto three years of which he spent in the city's heritage preservation department. And there he helped save classic motel signs and fast disappearing mid-century streetscapes. And um, he, he uh, aspires to organize the first international SCA conference in Niagara Falls, New York and Ontario. And he also has delusions about writing an SCA themed book on apron art. <laughs> well, I'll just let you take it away. I I have to admit a few more here. Okay, thanks, Michael. I'll, I'll get started. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Gallagher. I'm, as Michael said, the vice president of the SCA. I'm also a retired city planner living in Toronto, Ontario. I'm not an expert on the subject we're discussing tonight, but that doesn't mean I don't find all things SCA fascinating and worth investigating. For example, years ago, I started noticing interesting designs and information on the ground in the entranceway to some stores. Like any good SCA -er, I started taking pictures. One thing led to another, and we find ourselves here tonight. Most of the illustrations you will see tonight are from my collection. They come from Canada, the US, and elsewhere. Many were taken on SCA tours. Two SCA members, Steve Hartwich and Mike Karsten among them, have been kind enough to share some of their favorite images with me. For those pictures, I've indicated the source on the photo. I apologize in advance for the poor quality of some of my images. They were taken under all sorts of conditions, sometimes at night, occasionally through chain link fences and with fairly basic equipment. The signs themselves are often in poor shape. In all but a few cases, the businesses that created them are no longer there, and in more than a few, the buildings are abandoned and derelict. But I hope these pictures serve to give the viewer a sense of what this is all about. And maybe even get them looking down for these little gems in their community. Some people call them apron, apron art. Next slide, please. If you Google apron art, you get this. In fact, most people do not know that the entranceway to a retail store or other facility is technically called an apron. And art is probably not a very descriptive name for these works because although they are captivating and many are artistic in their execution, they were not intended to be art for art's sake. Even among those who appreciate them, there are other names for these features such as ground signs or signature tile. While the jury is still out regarding the name, I will use the term apron signs for this presentation because that's what they are signs that have been placed on the apron of a store. Next slide. I like them, but are they commercial archeology? span mm -hmm. Yes, because in form and function, they are signs, signs that are mounted on the ground. Signs are a big part of the SCA world. Whole museums are devoted to them. There are book tours, books, tours, websites, and columns about signs. Most of them celebrate beautiful neon signs, massive rooftop signs, billboards, painted wall signs, those that are animated, and every other type you can think of that are up above your head. Apron signs are under your feet. They serve a special purpose, but more about that later. There are no museums for apron signs, probably because they aren't very portable. So the shopping streets in our cities have to serve as open air museums for these works. How appropriate that a former David Owl store, which sold furniture in Kansas City, in Kansas City, is now the location of Copyprint, a company which also produces signs. We can only hope that Copyprint creates signs that are as beautiful and eye-catching as the one that drew people into its predecessor's store. But we can be pretty well, we can pretty well rest assured that Copyprint's own signs will not outlast its tenure in Kansas City, unlike its predecessor. Next slide.
Being signs that are designed that are designed to be walked on and exposed to the elements, they had to be made of something durable and washable. They would also have to be suitable for conveying messages, be enticing and look inviting. Given that most of these signs date from the late 19th century to the mid 20th century, the creators of these apron signs chose tried and true materials and methods that are still in use today. The most common are mosaic tiles, especially in the earlier signs, and terrazzo. Some signs combine both. There are even a few using other materials like the mosaic sign above that includes accents of marble. There's no plastic. The numbers contained in apron signs can be confusing. They are almost always the street's street number of the building as in the mosaic tile sign above, which is at 815 Elm Street in Cincinnati. That building was built in 1876 and started life as a house of ill repute. Now it's been converted to a high-end condo. But occasionally, the numbers are not the address of the building. The San Carlos Institute in Key West, Florida was established in 1871 and is located at 516 Duval Street. Even more confusing, the building was opened in 1924, replacing an earlier building damaged in a hurricane. It's unclear whether the E.T. Smith Hardware Furniture Company built this building in 1912 or its street address was 1912. We do know that the business was operational as early as 1905. Next slide. Let's talk a little about mosaics. For this information, I am grateful to Lillian Sizemore who provided an overview of the history of mosaics in her article in the fall 2019 SCA journal. Mosaic art is composed of small pieces of colored tile, glass, or other durable material set in a solid substrate, usually concrete, to create a design, lettering, graphic, or whatever is desired. It has a long history. The Greeks and Romans employed mosaic pavement designs to engage storytelling and conversation from the public bathhouses to the senator's villas. You are probably all familiar, familiar with the famous Kawe Kanem mosaic found in Pompeii, telling passersby to beware of the dog. An example is shown in the top left corner of the slide. Mosaic has a long tradition of use in places of worship as both a flooring material and to depict religious iconography. By the late 19th to mid 20th century, mosaic was once again being used for artistic and design purposes in public and private buildings. It offered durability, functionality, and brilliance, qualities which reflected the optimism of the era. In post-World War II America, mosaic became more widespread. Significant immigration by Italian tradesmen in the 20th century provided the expertise and experience required to realize these works at a reasonable price. You can see the workmanship involved in the Buick ground, siding, ground uh, sign in Kansas City, Kansas. That should be apron sign. Now a bit about Terrazzo. Oh, next slide, please. <clears throat> it also has a long pedigree, stretching back to ancient times. In those days, it was made using discarded marble chips that were bound together with a mixture of clay and goat milk. Nowadays, in order to save the goat milk to make goat cheese, modern terrazzo surfaces are constructed by adding colored marble chips to a mortar base, then sanding and buffing them to a glossy shine. It can be traced back to the ancient mosaics of, of Egypt, but its more recent predecessors come from Italy. Terrazzo was first introduced in the United States in the late 1890s, but did not achieve popularity, popularity until the 1920s. The invention of divider strips in 1924 solved the problem of the cracking of large expanses of terrazzo by allowing the material greater space to expand and shrink after installation. Stop. An example is the main walking street in Havana, Cuba above. It also had the happy side effect of providing straight or curved lines that increased the decorative potential of the material. Mechanization of the sanding and polishing process made terrazzo an affordable flooring option. And again, the influx of experienced installers from Italy in the 20th century helped to make it affordable. Terrazzo's main distinction from, it, from mosaic derives from the fact that it does not place individual pieces in a decorative pattern. 
Instead, small pieces are thrown into a mortar base, creating more a more uniform surface appearance. Recordive patterns are created by using dividers, which create lines between different colored terrazzo mixtures. Some apron signs incorporate both terrazzo and mosaic. We will see examples later in the presentation. There are also occasional examples of apron signs using other materials. The signs above contain all the information normally conveyed by apron signs, but don't involve mosaics or terrazzo. The Hotel National sign is marble. The Quattro Guts example is metal, and the Bacario version appears to be paint on a terrazzo step. Bacario means bakery in Icelandic. We probably don't see more of the marble and metal signs due to the expense involved in making them. Paint would not be a good candidate as it is not durable when walked upon. For example, the name of the bakery in black on the second line is mostly worn away. Next slide. Other examples present themselves. J.R. Cusco is constructed of tile and La Favorita appears to be an amateur version using tiles set in cement. These might properly belong to the homemade type of apron signs. They don't project the elegance or sophistication that these signs were often meant to, but they get the message across. If they were art, it would be in the style of Grandma Moses. Cusco is a medium-sized city in the highlands of Peru that was the ancient capital of the Inca Empire. I include it to show the busy street life that is the Norman Latin American cities, and also the interesting wall sign for the Henry Ford Escuela de Conductores, you have to excuse my Spanish, or Henry Ford Driving School, highlighted by the red circle above. One wonders what the apron sign for that business would look like. Next slide. Apron signs are found in the parts of our cities that supported pedestrian shopping. In North American cities, these correspond very closely to the original downtown and the so-called streetcar suburbs. Mm -hmm. Prior to the 1890s, public transportation was provided by horse-drawn streetcars or private vehicles, which were expensive and slow. Automobiles were just a twinkle in Henry Ford's eye. Most people walked. By necessity, cities were very compact. At the end of the 19th century, streetcar or trolley systems became electrified, meaning they could radiate, radiate out from the city core to a distance of about five miles and still provide a reasonable commute time to the central core. This resulted in a very rapid urbanization along streets with streetcar lines in the, in the form of two to three story buildings lining those streets and low density residential development stretching back from the commercial strips. Most of these houses still do not make any provision for private automobiles. People generally relied on the streetcar system for transportation and shopped close to home. The photos above illustrate the type of development we see in the streetcar suburbs. Even today, it's easy to see the extent of the original streetcar lines in any North American city. Just travel along a main street and notice where the built form changes from the two to three story retail on the first floor and apartments above blocks to more open automobile oriented development. That is where the streetcar lines end. The first floor of the buildings on the main streets would be non-residential stores, services, offices, etc. Local people would shop in them and they would be visible to those riding by on the streetcars. Most of the customers would be pedestrians. Merchants had to use every means available to, to them to entice the customers into the store on an up close and personal basis. Apron signs were part of this strategy. Most cities abandoned their streetcar systems in favor of buses or subways in the 1950s. Most residents abandoned public transit systems in favor of private automobiles around the same time. Apron signs have no impact on customers arriving by automobile. Thus their heyday was from the late 1800s to the early, six, early 1960s. Like most historical artifacts, apron signs have benefited from preservation by neglect. There are a few examples still extant in the downtown cores of our cities due to massive redevelopment. But along the streetcar suburb strips, Redevelopment pressure has been less due to societal and transportation changes in our cities from the 1960s onward. Here the signs survive, some pristine, some sadly deteriorated. There have been many losses to demolition, 
or new owners covering up that old fashioned thing on the floor of the entrance with ho-hum tile, carpet, rubber mats, etc. But if you walk the streetcar suburb streets of your city, you will find them. Next slide. Because most customers would arrive on foot, window displays were critical in showcasing what was on offer and convincing the potential buyer to cross the threshold. The practice developed of setting the door back from the street, thereby creating a protected space for the shopper to, shop, to stop and look and increasing the amount of display space available. Thus was born the apron, that semi-public, semi-private transitional space between the sidewalk and the entrance. The logical progression was an apron sign to entice the shopper in to look at the display windows and hopefully enter the store, especially since the storefront signs were now out of sight. Also, they offered a good chance to impart more information, such as the store name, street number, or a graphic representation of the high quality of the merchandise or service to be found within. Next slide. Like all advertising, Apron signs were designed to not only tell the potential customer what the establishment was selling, but also appeal to the patron's emotional needs. For example, would you feel that you're a part of high society if you traverse the sign on the upper right? And given the times, ladies might feel more comfortable shopping in a female-only environment in the store on the upper left. Who wouldn't want to venture into a store or space that welcomed good fellows or family? although the lock gates uh, take away a bit from the warm welcome one, one might expect from a family. All of these signs are at pedestrian personal scale, the opposite of painted wall signs as Ron Ladusseur explained in his excellent presentation a couple of months ago. Ironically, in today's marketing world, painted wall signs have now taken on the function of apron signs in many places. Their presence indicates a down home folksy type of business not the national brands of their predecessors. Next slide. Or you might want to project an image of sophistication. Who wouldn't feel a bit elevated crossing the apron sign of the Smithsonian Institution to be exposed to culture or entering the Napoleon House for a swanky dinner and show? Next slide. Some apron signs might appeal a little less to our psyche and rely more on the power of suggestion. These examples speak to a basic function of the signs to draw people into the store. JC Murphy Company was a five and dime regional chain. Note how the apron art for these two stores, although almost 800 miles apart, are very similar, but not identical. This illustrates the use of these signs to create brand recognition, but also that each sign was installed by local craftsmen who might make minor changes to the logo. It's hard to imagine that kind of latitude being allowed in today's worldwide advertising campaigns. Next slide. This type of apron sign has survived into the modern era. The similarity of the apron sign in the entranceway of an office building in Montreal, Quebec, and a Canadian road sign that indicates vehicles may travel on both sides of a traffic island is not a coincidence. Next sign. Next page. <laughs> and just in case you don't get the message, let's just spell it out. No one could accuse the storekeepers of Hoboken of being too subtle. Note the art, de art deco detailing on the moldings at the bottom of the display windows. The similarity of this apron sign to a later highway commercial sign is uncanny. Next slide. But each time a store or building owner decided an apron sign would be, would be good for business and should be included in the building plans, he or she would be faced with a decision as to what would bring the customers in over the long term. There are basically four alternatives, each representing increasing confidence in the permanence of the structure and or the business. First, we have geometric designs tailored to the uh, usually small and non-rectangular spaces available. They can go from simple borders to very sophisticated patterns and figures. I've yet to see any exact duplicates of these signs, probably because of the need to tailor them to an endless variety of spaces and the fact that they were installed on site by individual craftsmen. 
Although they don't convey any specific information, they're still apron signs as they invite the customer or patron in, often by their tapered shape. They also lend an air of elegance. These signs are sometimes used in entranceways to upper level apartments, as you can see by the lack of display windows on the sides. They come the closest to the examples of, to being examples of apron art and may have been the creation of the individual engaged to install them. Next slide. The next level of confidence would be including the number of the street address. Most property owners would not expect that information to change, although anyone doing research using old city directories knows that it can. The business owner at number six, at number 150 could not resist adding a sign on the right side wall below the display window, letting passersby know, passers know what was on offer. But that could easily be changed or covered if oysters were no longer a hot commodity. Next slide. The third level of confidence involves installing a graphic depicting the product or service to be found in the store. Not only could they be attractive, they could portray information without the use of words, handy in an area with many tourists. Both of these signs are from Havana, Cuba. They were installed before the revolution, which took place in 1959, in a main, a main tourist area, Calle Obispo. See the last word on the image to the right. The image on the left is a map of the island of Cuba. It's not clear to me what either of these stores were selling, but the signs are arresting and could induce shoppers to look at the windows. We'll see more apron signs from Calais Obispa later in the presentation. Next slide. Probably the most elaborate apron sign I have seen to date is this one in Miami Beach, Florida. It's not actually an apron sign being just inside the entranceway, but I've included it anyway, given its artistic merit. It may have been put just inside because of the lack of space on the apron of the store. Unfortunately, an insensitive store owner has decided to use this area as the shopping cart corral and has driven metal posts defining the cart area through the terrazzo. One wonders if there wasn't a better spot for the carts. The store is currently a grocery. I would guess that the original use was the same or a butcher shop selling poultry products and eggs, a diner specializing in breakfast, or a place selling either alarm clocks or earplugs. Whatever the use, this excellent graphic would certainly draw me in. Next slide. <clears throat> Apron signs may also be intended to make a statement especially if the establishment is a social service agency or political organization endeavoring to empower local residents and merchants. Venice on Vine is an organization in Cincinnati that operates small businesses which employ those facing barriers to employment. Its motto as enunciated, enunciated on its intriguing apron sign is power inspires progress. On a more informal and personal basis, uh, someone has scratched the kasbah into the sidewalk in front of a degraded apron sign leading to the upstairs apartment. Did the occupants of that apartment want to warn visitors that they're about to enter some dimly lit space filled with lounge lizards and hookah pipes that would tempt them away from the straight and narrow? Next slide. Finally, store owners with the strongest commitment to their future at that location proudly displayed their business name in their apron signs. In the first half of the 20th century, it was not unusual for the proprietors of the business to also own the building and live in the apartments above the store. However, there appear to be some who thought it prudent to pull back a bit and only display their initial on the apron sign. At least there would be a chance that the next owner would have the same initial. More likely this was a cost saving measure. One wonders if the owners of M moved their premises and had the same apron sign installed at the new location, but with the colors reversed to distinguish it from their old location. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next, uh, next slide. Other business owners simply took the plunge and proudly displayed their business names for all to see. Furniture stores seem to have favored apron signs. Perhaps their owners were trying to illustrate the permanence and solidity of their product by using a permanent and solid sign. Next slide. The 
It turned out that those foreseeing a level of permanence in their business location were somewhat misguided. Very few apron signs reflect the business that exists in the space today. Sometimes the new businesses have retained the signs, maybe as a nod to nostalgia, an appreciation of the workmanship involved, or simply because it's too expensive these days to have the sign redone to reflect the new operation. Today's business person may also have a greater appreciation for the fleeting quality of commerce in the 21st century. Here are a few examples. Next slide. This drugstore is located near a street called Malvern Avenue in Toronto. It may have been an independent pharmacy when the terrazzo was designed to convey its connection to the community. Now it's part of a pharmacy chain like so many others. Note that the apron sign is partially covered by a rubber mat in the right-hand photo. This is a common situation in which the apron sign enthusiast must move that mat or other obstructing materials in order to get a picture without arise, arousing the ire of the business owner or manager. Usually once the situation is explained and the owner is convinced you're not behind the recent rash of mat thefts, he or she will consent to the photo. God only knows what they tell their staff about the weirdo taking pictures on, of the ground outside. Occasionally, the owner will have some information on the origins of the sign, which is a bonus. Next slide. Here are two more. Tamblin was a regional drugstore in Toronto, which is long gone. Woolworths, you can just see the apron sign in front of the doors, was a national chain, which everyone knows, also long gone. And that would be Doug Town, our intrepid journal and road notes editor and apron sign aficionado in the black baseball cap standing in front of the former Woolworths in Wildwood, New Jersey on the uh, 2012 SCA conference there. Next slide. A few more. McCrory was a five and dime department store chain that had 1,300 locations in 1989, but closed by the turn of the century. The original Art Deco building of my, in Miami Beach is still there, and it's now split up into numerous smaller operations. One of the secondary entrances provided the entrance to Sando Lab, a sandwich restaurant that is now also permanently closed. Next slide. A few businesses have withstood the test of time. Meyer the Hatter still operates his business in New Orleans, proudly displaying a terrazzo sign with great art deco lettering. Next slide. The shopping mall in Reykjavik, Reykjavik, Iceland is still operating under the same name and includes a bonus grocery store. This apron sign is a beautiful example of brass letters inlaid in terrazzo. Next slide. I'm sure everyone would agree that apron signs are fascinating and even beautiful in many ways. But do they have a significance other than as curiosities from another era? My answer would be a resounding yes, because like most things SCA, they are a visible, accessible link to another time. They can help us to appreciate the layers that are inherent in the evolution of cities. They also remind us that this phase of a city's development will also pass. They can turn exploring those layers into a detective exercise worthy of Sherlock Holmes or Dick Tracy. It turns out to be addictive. An excellent example presents itself in Toronto. The picture, the picture on the left shows the current business at 508 Queen Street West. It's a punk rock bar called the Velvet Underground, which is right in the middle of Toronto's entertainment district. The facade of the business is a forbidding collection of security screens, discarded paneling, and other distressed materials. The doors look like they were designed to keep the patrons out rather than inviting them in. However, the spiky-haired habitues of this club have to cross an apron sign, which is now only partially visible. You can see a portion of an F, another F, and apostrophe S. Turns out that this is the remains of an apron sign for Rubinoff's, a clothing store that flourished on Queen Street in the 1950s when this area was the center of the Jewish clothing trade. The picture on the right shows a portion of the facade of that building in April of 1958. It's doubtful Rubinoff would have sold any clothing that would be of interest to the goth crowd at the Velvet Underground, although there are many hip clothing stores still in the neighborhood. 
However, Rubinoff might have appreciated the work that the Velvet Underground's operators had put into making the facade of their business attractive to their customers, just as he did back in the day with his apron sign. Next slide. Another interesting and unsolved case is 1419 Saint Laurent in Montreal. The current occupant is a, sur a surplus store called Kinsmo. Their very large apron sports a badly deteriorated terrazzo apron sign, which is partially covered by tile and upon which, and upon which the name Schiller's can just be made out by the edge of the sidewalk. The terrazzo apron sign extends under a partition to the left on which a single F can be seen. It is the end of a word which is now covered by store infrastructure similar to Rubinoff's. The store probably was somehow related to Schiller's given it uses the same font. A quick Google search revealed no clues as to who or what Schiller's was, but the dedicated sleuth would no doubt be able to get to the bottom of it in the city archives. Next slide. MK Furniture erected this distinctive building in 1961 to replace a Victorian building that had been destroyed by fire. MK stands for Michael and K Kennel, the, pro the proprietors. It then became a dollar store, very small businesses, and now a retail cannabis store, but the sign persists. Recreational use of cannabis is legal in Canada and the stores are everywhere. I'm looking forward to the first cannabis related apron sign. Next slide. Another interesting one, which illustrates the changing demographics of our cities exists in Cincinnati. Eck Brothers Florist Shop sported an apron sign which employed both terrazzo and mosaic. After being abandoned for several years, we find the space being used as an Islamic mosque. However, the mosque moved to new quarters in an abandoned school in the west end of Cincinnati as the over the Rhine area was being aggressively gentrified and it was now in the midst of a lot of bars and nightclubs which are not compatible with, these, with the Isla Islamic faith. The building is now a, an oh-so-hip clothing store called Kismet and the apron sign is still there. Do the, no, do the owners of the clothing store know that in Islam, Kismet refers to the will of Allah or manner, more generally something that was meant to be? The unintended connections between these successive uses is uncanny. Incidentally, this building includes a couple of stories of apartments above which appear to be of considerable vintage. Perhaps the original Eck brothers decided to leave those out of their advertising card to give the business a bit of a higher tone. In many of our cities, the streetcar suburbs where these signs proliferated are rapidly being gentrified after years of neglect. What does that mean for the signs? The next example might be instructive. Next slide. The Arliss building at 59 King Street West in Hamilton, Ontario is a good example of what can happen to apron signs when the gentrifiers move in. It also has two apron signs, each with their own story. Hamilton is an industrial city in Southern Ontario that was built on steel production. It suffered severely with the deindustrialization de of the North American economy in the last five decades. Its beautiful and vibrant downtown shopping district was decimated. In 1949, the Arliss Shoe Company acquired a building in the heart of the shopping district that had been built in 1915 and refaced in 1947. It installed its retail shoe outlet, among other operations on the main floor, you can see the sign circled with red, immediately west of a striking Art Deco branch of the SS Kresge Company, now demolished after a long and bitter preservation battle. It also renamed the building the Arliss Building. The entrance to the offices on the upper floor was on the right side of the building with an apron sign. Next slide. Arliss Shoes was replaced by a large Canadian-based shoe manufacturer and retailer known as Bata, who installed a tile and paint apron sign as befits the modestly priced merchandise for sale in that store. Eventually, Bata was replaced by a Salvation Army thrift store. We retained the Bata apron sign and confirmed the descent of the area's retail cachet to the lowest level possible. In the right hand picture, you can see the entrances to the offices where the Arliss building apron sign is still visible in what has by now become a forlorn resting place for the homeless. Next slide. 
By 2000, by the year 2000, Hamilton's downtown was starting to experience a renaissance, driven partly by the influx of young people from Toronto, 45 miles away, trying to find relief from the exorbitant housing prices in that city. The Arliss building was renovated once again and now includes retail on the first floor and high-end offices above. Interestingly, the 2000 renovation stripped away the 1947 facade to expose the larger windows and older architecture of the original 1915 building. These are all positive developments in helping a severely degraded city core come back to life. But the apron signs are nowhere to be seen. Perhaps there's no place for such old fashioned things in the new improved Hamilton. A note to preservationists, although relatively minor in the grand scheme of preservation of heritage buildings, don't neglect the apron signs when listing the heritage attributes of those historic properties and when considering redevelop redevelopment proposals. Next slide. But it's not just the buildings that are important in the story of apron signs. Often the business owners who had enough confidence to proudly advertise their names were the movers and shakers in the business and political life of their communities. It's easy to become a known figure when your name is splashed across the front of your store for all to see. Jerry's Man Shop was a fixture in the downtown shopping district of Hamilton for 90 years. Of course, neither of the two gentlemen pictured on the apron sign above were Jerry. They were Bernie and Mitchell Sherman, the son and grandson of Jerry Sherman, who was the son of the founder, Ansel Sherman. Ansel started the business which lasted for 90 years at the same location. After the store closed, the front was completely renovated as you can see in the right side picture. Its current occupant remains unknown and the superb apron sign is gone. Next slide. Before I end this presentation, I wanted to show some apron signs from Havana, Cuba, especially since it is difficult for our American members to visit that country. Prior to the revolution, the capital city Havana had a roaring tourist trade, especially with Americans. Several streets, among them Calle Obispo, which is Bishop Street in English, were known for their upscale shops. Many of them had apron signs of particular elegance, mostly in Terrazzo. The next three slides show some of these in street scenes of pre-revolutionary days. Now, of course, the, store, the stores are mostly devoid of goods and the crowds are mostly tourists wanting to soak up the charms of old Havana. Next slide. You can see that the Cubans were not hesitant to use signs overhanging the streets too. There are names in English, French, and of course, Spanish. Bilateria, excuse my Spanish, means ticketing office and the address is 512 Calle Obispo, Bishop Street. Next slide. It's surprising to me that these apron signs have survived as they would have been seen as instruments of American imperialism. Perhaps the communist regime retained them to remind the population of the decadence of the capitalist system and the exploitation of Cuba. In at least one case, however, someone has driven a stake through an apron sign for Vernet shoes, perhaps striking a blow for the sensible footwear of the proletariat. Next slide. So what of the future? Given the transitory nature of business in this day and age, business owners may be hesitant to invest in such permanent and non-portable signs. However, apron signs are making a comeback in shopping areas that are pedestrian oriented. These are usually the hip, cool parts of town where people live in dense, wash, dense neighborhoods and patronize local stores and services, just like the streetcar suburbs. A sure sign that an apron sign is new is if it advertises the actual operation on the premises. That's yours truly standing with Ben's Panda. It seems that businesses that have apron signs may also have other roadside features of interest to us yayers. Next slide. An article on apron art, so-called by apron art, so-called by SCA tour leader Kevin Patrick, appeared in the fall 2012 issue of the SCA journal. It was authored by then and still editor Doug Town. Richly illustrated, it provided a great overview and some personal observations on the subject. I've borrowed from this work and also from an article on mosaics by Lillian Sizemore, which appeared in the fall 2019 journal. Other sources are listed at the next slide. Next slide. And of course, thanks again to Mike Karsten and Steve Hartwich, both SCA members who provided some of the images. And next slide. 
If you have any photos of apron signs that you would like to share, I would love to see them. If I use them in any future work on this subject, I would be pleased to attribute them to the photographer. Please email them to B-G-A-L-L-A-U, that's Brian Gallagher for six letters of last name, at gmail.com. Most useful are multiple shots from different angles and distances of and distances of the apron sign and the building facade to provide context. The address is also important and any historical information and, uh, or pictures that may be available. Most of the archives that are now at least are now at least partially online, which makes looking for historical photos much less onerous than previously. Thank you for your attention. I hope you found the material stimulating. Maybe you will discover some of these hidden gems in your own community. So next slide. Oh, there's no more slides, so we can go back okay. to just uh, seeing all the people's faces. <laughs> Stop the share. There we are. I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, anyone might have. Well, there's a bunch of uh, comments here. Uh, Stephanie Stuckey loves the cons meat products sign. Do you know where that is? That's in uh, Cincinnati. Yeah. Richard Davis said that's one hell of a clock. That's in Cincinnati too. Uh, let's see. Jeremy said he was impressed that how many of these are not covered by mats. He feels like wherever he sees them, they're always covered underneath a mat. Well, uh, when I see them, they're often covered under mats too, and you have to move the mat, which draws attention. <laughs> And that's yeah. usually filthy underneath as well. Um, but that just makes it more interesting. <laughs> Dean said, we've got one covered by Matt here in Elmhurst, Illinois, for a restaurant that closed about 40 years ago. It's easy <laughs> to push the, the mat away <laughs> to show the sign, though, folks. Uh, I was in, I'm Joe Marlin. I live in Chicago. I was in Joliet, Illinois, which is about 40 miles away, and I found a... Uh, a very plain, uh, ordinary uh, apron sign just uh, two weeks ago today. I'll be glad to send it to you. Oh, I love that. Thank but you. I don't have, I didn't get the address or take a picture of the facade. Uh, so, but at least I'll send you, uh, and it's it's not a, a very fancy one. It's not in marble or mosaic. I think it was just uh, a painted uh, lettering on cement, but it is an apron sign and entranceway. It is an apron sign for sure. I'd love to see it. Um, Stephanie Stuckey shared a Cress image. You can download in the chat. Uh, Dean said there are still two Woolworth stores in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Oh, really? Interesting. Yep. Photos? And Doug said, thanks for the shout out, Brian. And that was Penny, a former SCA member, also in the image. Ah, okay. Uh, and Stephanie Stuckey said, don't know if y'all can see this, but this is a beautiful crest mosaic apron sign I recently saw in LaGrange, Georgia. Yeah, I think you have to download it. And Karen Kinnear said, my great uncle had a furniture store called Ray's in Dayton, Ohio. The store is long gone, some 45 years, but the apron sign remains. And Jeremy said, Woolworths are still very common supermarket in Australia and New Zealand. Not sure if they're related to our North American Woolworths or not. And Doug said, hi, Karen, send a photo of the store apron and a little write up for future inclusion in the SCA news. And there's still a Woolworths open in Bakersfield, California. Stay tuned for the full story in the upcoming issue of SCA news courtesy of Rolando Pujol. Uh, Ben's is a DC institution, Richard Davis. Lillian says, thanks, Brian. Richard Davis, what a treat, thanks. Steve, thanks, Brian. I've never seen this many apron signs, excellent. These are just accolades, I can save them for you. Bring on. <laughs> uh, questions? 
maybe we could have SCA members contribute store apron images to the website in a sort of crowdsourcing project, start a permanent archive of these amazing advertisements. Actually, uh, if I can uh, jump in here, Michael, I see from Steve, he says, Brian, that big Buick script sign is in Tacoma, Washington. Actually, that one was sent to me by um, uh, one of our, uh, oh, maybe it was, is this, I guess that is Steve Hartwich, but he had taken, I thought that's picture in Kansas City, either Kansas or Missouri, but I, I could be wrong about that. However, it could be more than one of those signs too. Um, are there any geographical difference in where they are distributed, especially West Coast versus East Coast, North or South, Canada or US? Well, I don't have many pictures from the West Coast because I really, uh, I, I, last time I visited the West Coast was probably before I started getting interested in these. I, I think really where they, where they still exist is on the streetcar suburbs and that have not been redeveloped. So probably the East Coast and, and uh, Central, you know, Midwest and Central towns are the ones that were really developing strongly during the streetcar suburb era. Although Los Angeles, of course, had a huge network and I guess so did San Francisco. Um, so I, I don't really know the answer to that question, but where they are is where there used to be streetcars. And mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of streetcars on, in the Eastern half of the continent. Uh, they, they're not as prevalent in Canada because Canada was, is not as wealthy a country as the US and so, they didn't have, people didn't have as much money to put into decorating their stores. The buildings aren't as are nice, they aren't as big, they aren't as ornate. And uh, that's reflected in the, in the sort of a little more modest version of the apron signs. So some of the really good ones are, are in the US. And of course, there were amazing ones in Cuba. And Brian, I just sent you from some from downtown LA. Oh, great. Thanks, Janice. Mm -hmm. Todd asked where there's sign shops that specialized in apron signs? I don't know the answer, but I think that they were just put in by individuals, you know, yeah. um, a mason or a person who was uh, experienced in Trezzo, because they're small, right? They're all very small. So, and they're all different. So there, I'm sure there were companies that did, you know, uh, have those people working for them, but it seems to me to be kind of a cottage industry more than anything else. And he also, um, I think someone already asked that about, you know, the prevalence in certain regions of the country. Yeah. He answered that. Um, Alan Woodruff said, we have some great apron signs in Asbury Park, New Jersey, uh, Grants, Learner Shops, and Steinbachs. He's, he said they'll send them to the... Oh, great. That'd be wonderful. You know, Bill attached a photo. Oh, Janice sent you some. Bill sent you one from Peterson Avenue in Chicago, part of a mid-century modern commercial district. Townhouse furniture is recently deceased. <laughs> and Lillian asked, is the Napoleon House apron is actually in New Orleans? Oh, you know what? That could be a mistake as well. That one was sent to me by uh, Mike Karsten. Um, uh, who's on the board, and uh, that was one of his favorites. And actually, I think he did say it was in New Orleans, so I may have mislabeled it in the presentation. Uh, Lillian said the West Coast has a lot of marble entryway versus tile. Oh, that'd be interesting. Um, yeah, I can't. S uh. There's an apron sign Facebook group, or he's proposing, Russell's proposing an apron sign. Mm -hmm. Facebook. Um, Stephanie Stuckey asked, are there particular chains especially known for apron signs, like Woolworths, Cress, others? Again, I don't know. You see a lot of Woolworths ones, and they're, they are standardized, unlike the uh, one, uh, the Murphy sign that was similar, but not exactly the same. Um, that's an interesting question. It'd be worthy of investigation. And Rhodes asked, longevity probably has something to do with the difficulty of tearing them up. 
Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's a good point. The longevity is good because they're still there. Um, but, you know, I think what people did, what many people have done is they've covered them up. So if you walk down the streetcar suburb streets of any city, you'll see all kinds of aprons that are just tile or sometimes concrete. And I think they're covering up a lot of these signs. Um, but in many cases, they've, uh, rather than ripping them out, they just cover them up a lot easier. However, um, many people have it, and that's where you still see them. So uh, we're lucky that, that some people have preserved them or just by neglect more than anything else. I think uh, Karen Kinnear maybe meant, missed you explaining why they're called apron signs. Well, that's the, the name I've chosen to use for them. It's by no means official or a wide acceptance. And in fact, we used to call them apron art, but I... I was calling them apron signs because they are placed on the apron of a, of a store, which is an apron meaning the entrance way or the way you get into it. And it's not just stores. It can be, uh, for example, a, uh, airplane hangers have aprons and, and airplane terminals have aprons. And then in my opinion, they, although they're very artistic, they're not art, they're advertising, they're signs. Uh, they're exact same as hanging a sign in front of your building uh, or out over the street, um, but they're on the ground. They're on the apron. So uh, I've I've decided they call them apron signs. I think it's the like the entry apron. They yeah, that's right. That's a kind of a technical name for it, I think. But uh, that's uh, that's what it's called. Um... Gail said, Howard Johnson's had apron signs of the pie man. Well, that'd be good to get one of those. Lillian said, there's an Instagram account called I have this thing with floors that shows <laughs> hundreds of apron signs and, the and of course, tile floors. I, I would I would love to see uh, if people have them or if they if this has kind of uh, motivated them to go out and look for them. I would love to to um, to get uh, copies of your pictures of these things because and of the buildings as well that they are on because that shows that they're you know you know the apron sign and the building are, are almost always very different now. Um, because I may take this a little further. Um, I don't know about an issue or an article in the journal because um, Doug already did one and it was a very good one, by the way. So it's kind of been covered, but I might expand this into a little bit further exploration of these things and particularly the social aspects and also the sleuthing, you know, finding out what, what an old sign that doesn't, it maybe only partially there, whatever means and what the history of the building was and so far, so forth. So if people have signs, um, I'd love to see them because, and of course I would be happy to attribute them to the photographers um, if, if you have some. Do you know anything about the, uh, there was a, a very deep apron, I think the, it was in Miami, but I may have the wrong city for Bear, B-A-E-R. Right. And the, the windows were ex extraordinarily Art Deco looking, but the, uh, but the uh, 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 floor was not, and the lettering for Bear was very plain which made me wonder if all of that flooring was there and then the store redid the windows later on because otherwise you would expect that all would have been in one piece that the lettering for the name would have been in more of an Art Deco 1930s de uh, design or something, but it didn't fit, they didn't fit together. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm looking at the picture right now, Joe, and you're right, the, it, the, the surfacing below the windows is, it looks modern or at least maybe from the 80s or 70s. That, that establishment, Bears, is in Sonora, California. Actually. Oh, it's in California. Yeah, so there's I remember. an example of some that are on the, on the West Coast as well. But I agree that that facing doesn't look like it matches or would have been installed at the same time as the apron sign. 
I had a question on one of the early slides. You said something about like every all the images except the dog. Does that mean you took that photo? Well, no, I took the dog photo. The, the Kawe Kanem, you know, beware of the dog. That's that's off the net. So um, uh, I I didn't take that one. I wish I had because it's in Pompeii, and I'd love to go to Pompeii, and one day I will. But uh, but that's just off the net. But the other signs on that page were, I believe, from. Uh, were ones from my collection. No, actually they weren't. It's interesting the, the other signs on that page. So the Kawe Kanem, beware of the dog sign is, is off the net, it's from Pompeii to illustrate the use of mosaics, you know, a long time ago. Um, and then the other signs were all um, uh, given to me by uh, Mike Hartwich. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're all from Kansas City, Kansas mm. on that page. The Buick and the Kaw Valley line signs. Uh -huh. Dean remembers seeing that song, that dog in Pompeii. Yeah, I'd love to see that one day. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's all the questions I see. Okay, that's great. Well, keep the keep those pictures coming in, and uh, I'll let the the group know if I decide to take this any further and maybe go for a small book or something like that. And um, because I think this is an interesting topic that a lot of people are interested in. So thanks very much, everyone. Okay, thanks everyone. And thank you, Brian. You're welcome. And next month we have Bill Swislow on the 15th. Don't forget that. Okay. Stay um, tuned. Sounds great. Okay, thanks. Right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you.